Uh, we have this class, mm -hmm. conclusions, mm -hmm. basically historical stuff and conclusions. Mm -hmm. And then next week, I said I would do translations and study. Oh, right. Right. Okay. And then the next oh, week, on. I'll do veracity. Oh, you're, you're going to be here two more weeks. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep doing until we run, until we get to the Jesus uh, birthday thing or whatever we do. What do we agree to do for next next session? What's that? What do we agree to do for next session? Torah. The Torah class. So I'll redo the Torah class, and I don't know if it'll take uh, one or two classes, uh, one or two semesters, trimesters, what we're doing. But uh, I, I'll plan for one and then see if it works into two. Oh, there's another one. Where is everybody? I don't know. I was just saying. <laughs> They're playing hooky. They got, they got so excited about ending Hebrews. <laughs> But I've got uh, I've got good stuff for us, and um, and I and I I'll, this, these uh, these are the fun things. If you want to come to the fun classes, I guess you know that just like this one will be very interesting because it'll be able to look at history and stuff that we can't look at all the time. And then the translations class, what I keep promising, I've done before, but you know a study stuff and, and that kind of thing. And matter of fact, I had somebody ask about interlinears, and uh, I've got that in information there too. And then um, I thought I'd do an expanded veracity, and then, like I said, we'll just play it by ear. But I'll fill up the, the rest of the semester and give you worthwhile stuff. I give your money's worth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I picked the words today, you know, L O G O S, logos. And the reason I picked that is because this is a word that is always translated, mistranslated, in my opinion, said, because to a Greek person, this word means a logical argument, always means a logical argument. Um, I don't know, I, it's beating a dead horse, but I didn't, I just, this seems like the premier word since it's probably the word most, it's maybe the word most used in the New Testament, Le Lego and Logos. And it's the word that's translated, you know, um, mistranslated, in my opinion, all the time. Like in John, the word, right? Logos here, and this is the word, this is the word, this is logos. In the beginning was the word. But it's not word. It means literally something said. And it means specifically a discourse, a subject discourse and reasoning. They say also. But most specifically in Greek means a logical argument. Period. That. That's right. We know that, right? Because we call it logic. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a software program that they used to make for kids called Logos. And Logos means logic. Period. And argument. Anyway. And then we have the word T E E L O S. Telos. And telos is the unstated conclusion. Specifically means. Um, I put, I, I copied this, so I probably shouldn't have copied this, um, but we know that the telos is the, the um, projection of, pr projection of the, projection of a shape, not shape, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a projection on the horizon. Um, perspective line? What's that? The vanishing the, perspective. The, yeah, the vanishing point, the vanishing point. It's the vanishing point on the line, which, it, okay, this should be really interesting to you. Okay, here's a historical beautiful. When did Western art begin using vanishing points? 1400s, Renaissance time period. Yeah, exactly. When did the Greeks start using vanishing points in art? Probably earlier. They did everything else earlier. No, they never did. Really? Yeah, yeah. If you look at Greek art, what's, well, they, they may have used vanishing points, but what is the biggest characteristic of Greek art? It looks flat. Yeah, it's two-dimensional. You know, there is some, if you go look at the Pompeo things, right, there are some, um, what do you call it, you know, shading and, and graduation kind of trying to look there's like no depth. Yeah, there's very little depth, right? right? There is some. So obviously maybe they conceived of it, but the vanishing point to them was more important where? Where do you think? Where do you really see the vanishing point idea? Do you remember that they made columns? 
They made the columns so they looked straight by making them bow out. You remember that? They basically, the Greeks were really, they really were whacked about symmetry. Totally whacked about symmetry. To the point that they would make their, when they made the columns at first, if you make a column straight and you look up at it, what does it look like? It gets skinnier. It gets skinnier, like because of perspective. So the Greeks were like really into, well, I want it to look square and I want it to look straight. So when they made their, when they made buildings even, they made the walls bow out slightly so that the perspective was that they were straight. This is really weird if you think about it, right? It, to us, from an artistic perspective, we'd say, <coughs> would, you make a, would you make a skyscraper bow out intentionally so it looks straight? No. In fact, you'd say in the perspective it looks strange. So what I'm telling you is you have a society... Okay, they complain about us just drilling through like, like hills to make straight roads. I think that's a very positive thing. A straight road means you get less, takes less time to go, less energy to get there, right? And safer. And safer. The Greeks would have done what to make it better? They would have made the road, they, well, they would have built roads in What's that? Like an exit wound. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah, then exactly. So to the Greeks, it didn't matter whether you got there quickly or you got there safely. It's that you got there and it looked good. Just saying. So I'm just saying, this is really a very different way of looking at the whole wide world. But we know that we have the logos to tell us, and that's the whole point. So Hebrews is a set of logos to tell us that gives us to an end point. And what I did... And we'll go through this a little bit, but I tried to, I went back through the whole thing of our translation we did, and I grabbed the primary thoughts in each chapter. And if this looks really different than what you see in some of the outlines you get on Hebrews, well, thank the Lord that it's what I would call a cultural understanding, but we'll see how it fits together. And I think it's, um, okay. Has anyone looked at a Hebrews outline recently? Go back and look at one sometime just for fun and tell me, does it look reasonable? I would argue that it goes like this. Because the authors, if you look at it from a translation that is not cultural, it is not logical. It is very, you know... They have warnings about this. I have it in my notes. Um, let's see. I, I don't think I erased it from my notes, but I'm, yeah, I did. I took it out of my notes. I just got the first part of Hebrews itself. But, uh, yeah, okay. Um, here, here's, here's some of it. I've got a little bit of it here. Uh, chapter 1, the first warning. Don't drift. Uh... The, the uh, second chapter, demonstrated by his humanity. Oh, the theological basis for Christ's superiority. Let's see. Uh, Christ is superior to Moses. The second warning, don't defect. Uh, Christ is superior to Aaron. The third warning, don't degenerate. Uh, the reminder of the promises of God, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Anyway. Does that sound reasonable, logical to you? Does it even sound like it fits together in a logical sequence? You know, especially since they're talking about, okay, they start with the first warning. The theological basis for Christ's superiority and the first warning. Don't drift. That just doesn't fit anyway. Anyway, we'll look at this, and that's what I got. But what I really wanted to look at to begin with is let's go back in time and I try to remind you of the time factor, but you notice what I put against the board here. So we'll have an oral test. You guys all know these numbers. These are all, all ones we talk about. What is the significance of minus 6, or 6 BC? Minus 6 AD, 6 BC. Christ's birth. Christ's birth. <laughs> oh no! What happened? What happened? 
Yeah, a month counted wrong, and we started with the wrong date. As a matter of fact, Augustine, it was Augustine, it was during, uh, I think Augustine, it's during Constantine, right? And somebody was trying to calculate it for Constantine, I believe, and they got six years off because they were using the Roman something or other and got all mixed. I don't remember. I didn't. the date of the founding of Rome or something, and they miscounted. And they miscounted. Yeah, something happened that wasn't quite right. The most important thing to recognize from this, though, is what? Okay, okay. Today, I have an Apple Watch on my arm right here. This Apple Watch is connected to the Internet through my phone. My phone is connected to an atomic clock. How accurate is my watch? Perfectly. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that's messing it up is probably the cosmic rays coming through the walls. And, you know, the fact that the Earth is spinning so fast that it's got a little bit of, um, what do you call it, precession. Holy smoke! We, ha we are walking around with timepieces that are as accurate as atomic clocks in our arms. And they've got GPS time, too. Which, by the way, if you have GPS time, it means, you know what that means, right? It's atomic time. Not only is it atomic time, it's corrected for the movement of the Earth and the satellites. This is really big stuff. So, is it, should it be odd to us that someone made a six-year error? Yes. No, we, not. I mean, given what they had at the time, that's not really strange at all, I don't think. Because the documentation of precise time was not very good. I mean, they dated off events, like so-and-so's rain or you know, whatever. So it would be pretty hard to count back, I would think. But some things are extremely accurate. You look at um, some of the Old Testament books, <clears throat> the, the dates were laid out, they, those were brought up to current. Um, but at Ezekiel, it, there's just a bunch of things that I would argue right on the nuggets. I would argue, and, I'll, and I'll, I would argue that both the Hebrews and the Greeks were not really particular about precise time. And this is something that really messes up our um, <clears throat> what, okay, you know what I'm talking about. What is the first argument that any non-Christian person brings up to you? And even some Christians do this all the time. About the resurrection of Christ. Oh, it's like mythological or allegorical. Why though? What is their biggest argument? Because it's miraculous. It's like not scientific or historic. Well, you're getting way... You're, if you look back at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many people were at the resurrection of Christ? Different, different amounts at different times. Well, each of those accounts we have gives us a different number. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is there a different number? Nobody's really paying attention to how many people were there because that was insignificant. That is, that is a beautiful answer because that's it, right? The Greeks didn't care. Remember, I started this. I said, did the Greeks care about a column being straight? No. They cared about a column looking straight, right? So when you go back, if, you're, if you were writing in a Logos to Telos style, right, what do you care about? That the people get the telos. The people get the telos. So does it matter how many people were there to a Greek writer? No. no. They just care. Like, for example, you see a lot of times that it'll, it'll mention a group, right? And in fact, it'll use really interesting plural, plural verbs. And it'll have a, a singular person there. What does that imply? more people there, they just only bothered to name that one. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like when, when an author writes a conversation and there's a whole bunch of people and he's talking be between two in a dialogue, well, you ignore all the other people. Who cares? You do the same thing. You go to a cocktail party and you're talking with somebody, you're ignoring the other conversation, or maybe having an ear out, but you're ignoring most of the other conversations. So the Greeks really didn't care about the numbers precisely, and the Hebrews didn't either. Well, and they yes, ma'am. The yeah, there there was a terrible pro well terrible problem. They used numbers for consonants, or they used consonants for numbers. They used consonants for writing, and they had no vowels. Mm -hmm. So the there are problems with implicated. We call them implicated numbers. But if you're reading along, and all of a sudden you hit a consonant, and it how do you know it's a number? 
How do you know it's a number? It better be in context, right? If it's like, okay, so let's say that A or V, let's say V is a, in English, is means 10,000. Well, every time I read V, and by the way, V is the most common word in the English language. Every time I hit V, it's like, is it V or is it 10,000? How do you know? Only within context. Because there were an awful lot of 40 days and 40 nights. Well, in the 40 days and 40 nights, we, uh, you know, we know why that is, right? Well, it's a euphemism. Yeah, it's, it's a Hebrew euphemism. Yeah. Because, it, and by the way, every society has these types of euphemisms. Because every society had a problem counting. And by the way, you see this, like for example, um, uh, well, Indians, Indian, you know, the Indian thing, many, many moons, right? Mm -hmm. the, what do you know when I tell you many, many moons? I immediately know that, how do I count my time? By a lunar cycle, right? Yeah. You know, which by the way means I'm really messed up because a lunar cycle is not the same as, uh, as a sihedral. You know there are three types of ways to tell time with the sun. Sihedral, solar, and what's the other one? Sidereal solar is another one. Then you can tell time lunar by lunar, and you can also tell time by days and nights, just counting the days and nights. But how do I count the day and night? The Hebrews count the days and nights different than we do, right? Yeah, they start in the evening. Yeah. Uh oh. That goes down. And how do you know it's a day or night, especially if it's like dark? Well, they don't. You know, remember, and I didn't bring all my notes, but, you know, I used to, well, in the beginning of the class, I always go, and that's what we'll get when we go back to Torah class, because I'll start with that. How do you know, you know, time? It's huge. And so I would argue that this is not odd. You know, miscounting by six years. And, and by the way, okay, um, I'll just throw this out, but I, I've had people tell me, church people, which is great, because it means they're reading their Bible, but they say, you know, NASA went back and found out that there was a day missing, and, you know, that was the day that supposedly, you know, Moses stopped the thing, you know, Joshua, Joshua stopped, stopped, anyway, do you realize that a day in that much time calculated, it's less than point zero 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 you know, percent, it wouldn't affect anything, you know. It's like a second in a year. If you, you know, correcting a second a year, it's a big deal to the National uh, Clock Authority when they do it, but it doesn't mean anything. Does it mean anything to you? Do you even notice a second missing from your year? I'm just saying, it, it's almost, Ill, it's so illogical, it's silly. It's called macro. You know, you do a macro analysis and it doesn't fit the thing. So I'm just saying, we, we, you can't, you got to use reason, right? We got the three methods to know truth, and this is the way I can reintegrate that, but the three methods to know truth. So, 33 AD. What's 33 AD? Death, Death and resurrection of Christ. Death and the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, that's the, and, and by the way, do you notice something about that date? What is so big about that date? The fact it's so accurate. Nobody in the world disagrees that 33 AD is not the death and resurrection of Christ. They will say it's not the resurrection, but there's no one in historical knowledge that can say that it's not the death of Christ, right? And so important that what did they do to our calendar? The presumption was that Christ died in 33 AD, but they didn't start our calendar based on when he died. They started the calendar based on his, the presumption of his birth, which was supposed to be 0 AD, right? This is a big deal. They knew this date. They got this date a little bit wrong. Because they knew Herod died in 4 BC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they just counted it wrong. Yeah, and by the way, <laughs> okay, we knew Herod died in 4 BC. 4 BC, that's cool. This is something that non-Christians use against you all the time. Because what what do you say? 
Well, Christ was born in 0 AD. Well, Herod died in 4 BC. So how could how can you be right? Yeah. And what you have to do as a Christian is you have to say, well, I know the dates, you know, Christ was really born in 6 BC. They made an error. What's so hard about that? Now, the Pope may not be able to say that, but we can, you know, right? That's what Martin Luther cut us away from the Catholic Church. But I think what's really amazing is, do you realize that the world's time structure is based not on this necessarily, but on this? This is the defining moment that people cared about. <clears throat> the birth just happened to be, well, let's start at the beginning of the Messianic Age, which is, by the way, what it is. I'm going to put it in here, although it's a false thing. This is the beginning of the Messianic Age. Why do you mean by it's a false thing? Because it really, the beginning of the Messianic Age is 6 BC. Oh, so you but, put that's a zero. But the oh. zero, yeah, I'm sorry. Zero, zero time is the beginning of the Messianic Age. Everything this way is... the seventh day of creation, yeah. everything this way is the messianic age, which is the eighth day. If, if you want to play that, I mean, the, matter of fact, there's even a bookstore called the eighth day because the eighth day is a synonym for the messianic age. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is really cool stuff, but historically, right, God rested, the implication is that he's back to work. He's back to work. Yeah, the age of Messiah, God is back to work. But he was sure working hard this period too, right? Anyway, I think the I think made him work pretty hard. Yeah, really. <laughs> beautiful stuff. 52 A.D. 52 A.D. Paul, is Paul's death somewhere in between those dates? Um. Well. 52 AD, I put it up here because this is the date that we know that Thessalonians, he wrote the first letter, 52 AD, to the Thessalonians. And we studied 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, which means that Paul was converted sometime between 33 AD and 52, right? So, and we know, we don't know the exact time. I mean, some people try to work it out, but we don't know exactly. But Paul was converted in this time. And I've told you before, where was Paul in 33 AD? At, at Jerusalem. He saw it, and he never talked about it. You know why he never talked about it? I wouldn't either. Well, maybe I would have. But Paul didn't because it was very embarrassing to him. It was completely embarrassing to him. And if you look in his writings, and this is the thing about Pauline writings, look for the clues. Because Paul was there. Paul saw Christ. He knew Christ. His greatest embarrassment. And probably, you know, when he talks about the thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the flesh may have been the fact that he was at Christ's death and resurrection, and he didn't get it. He didn't recognize it. It is a horrible thing, the most horrible thing in the world, to be to be there and miss that, the greatest thing that he concludes, the greatest thing that ever happened in humanity. Well, I've already told you. But look what happened, though. God still used him. God, amazingly, God still used him, which gives hope for everybody, right? Paul is the predominant Christian. Because he was still Christian. He was busy. Right? He's this chief of sinners. You know, he's the worst sinner, right? Um, you know, if you think I was part of the group that put, you know, God to death, that would definitely make you think, call yourself chief of sinners. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I'm glad you said that because I, if I leave, if I left any impression, I think Hebrews, well, all the other New Testament documents do too. But human, humanity put God to death. If Christ, okay, we believe in three and one, not one and three, not three beings, not separate. Okay, go through the Anesthesian craze, creed. They're all one. So if you kill one, you, you kill them all. The, mirac the miracle of the resurrection isn't the resurrection of the body of Christ. 
The miracle of the resurrection is the resurrection of God, which shows that God is outside of of the cosmos and time. Yeah, He is not part of the creation. Therefore, you can kill him all you want, but the miracle is, this is a proof text, not just of the deity of Christ, but a proof text of the deity of God. Why is that a big deal? Historically, are there bunches of gods hanging around? They're all, yeah. with, they're they're all, all in, in the, the cosmos. They're all within that. Well, even yeah. Buddha and all those, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're all, you know, okay. Um, it, it became popular after the Jews, it didn't become popular for the Jews, but after Christianity, what became very popular? Resurrections. Yeah, resurrections suddenly became the spice of all the new prophets. And the other thing that was really cool is creation accounts. It were no kidding, creation accounts. Before this, have you ever read all the, the Gilgamesh creation account and the creation account of the, the Egyptians and the creation account of the myths, right? Bulwer's myths. What happened? Well, the gods were just there. They were, they, were, they were in the creation. And they didn't create. They were just there. You know, they took the things around them and made them into whatever they made them into. As opposed to the Judeo-Christian view, which is, in the beginning, gods, with a singular verb, who created. So there was nothing, right? And then there was something, which is a huge difference between there's something and then there's something, right? Yeah. Even atheists have to have their own creation myths, like either the universe is eternal or that's what they thought before the Big Bang and then now their theory. They're, they're desperately trying to find a way that the Big Bang like, could happen, like that there was something that caused it to happen. You know? Yeah, yeah, a super intelligence. Right. <gasps> oh no, that's God! You know, it's, it's just beautiful how human beings twist themselves into pretzels. Yes, ma'am? If all God died, if all God died, wouldn't the world have come apart? I mean, if God was not holding it that what it shows is that God is outside of the creation. And the creation is dependent on God. So yeah, if God really did, God can't die. He can't go away. He's eternal, eternal, immortal, you know, that's what makes him God. But the Greek gods and the gods of the other, other gods, you know, until, like I said, after Christ, now all of a sudden they bingo, bango, bongo become you know, like Muhammad, for example, right? Muhammad was created from a mishmash of, of Christianity, Judaism, and, you know, paganism. So, you know, what kind of background does he have? I mean, it's like, well, you know. But, you know, like I said, after the resurrection of Christ, all of a sudden everybody was being resurrected. Pretty cool. Mithras even. Well, Mithras, is, that's not a happy story at all. I won't go into that. But anyway, okay, 55 A.D. Something? <clears throat> Death of Paul. Now, many argue, um, many argue, they don't know when, but uh, most, most think Paul died in Rome around 55 AD, which means that all the letters that he wrote were written between 52 and 55 AD which is a lot of writing and a lot of doing, right? But it also is very interesting to us because there is very little historical disagreement on the date of Thessalonians. There is some argument about the death of Paul. But even the later put, you know, they don't put him, his death passed around 62 AD. If it's 55, he it gives us a you know, we said six years is a, you know, uh, it's a squish. Grounding error. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a grounding error. It's nothing, right? It's a tracking error. It's, it's very little, right? So if I got it placed between 52 and 55, that's, that's, pretty that's pretty accurate, right? 
which means that when you argue or when you talk with people about the, especially Paulian letters, this is all before the end of the century. This is all within how many years? Within nine years of the death of Christ? 19. 19, did I this? 19. 19 years. That's, okay, that's from the, twi- I still remember what happened in 2000. Well, Tammy says sometimes not that well, but it's close enough, right? So, yeah. you know, I was around in 2000. I remember 2000, and you may too. Uh, Hopefully somebody got married. That see, there you go. It's a, you even have pictures, right? So my point is this. When people argue and they say, well, you know, what about those New Testament documents? Well, guess what? Almost more than half of them, about three, you know, two thirds, three quarters, were all within one period way close to Christ's death and resurrection. And we're not even talking about Didache, which we can't place, we haven't been able to place, which is really early. And then we got the Gospels, and then we got the other strangey works, like Hebrews, right? 70 AD. Destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. This this is a this is a seminal date for lots of reasons. Um, we really need to go into a little detail about the destruction of Jerusalem. What did Jesus Christ tell the disciples in all of his apocalyptic stuff? And we just heard it. Uh, one will be, two women will be grinding, and one will be taken. Two men will be out hoeing in the field, and one will be taking, taken. Now we take that to be. Well, what do you think? I don't know. I'm just telling you. Jesus said the temple will be destroyed, right? The Greeks are concrete, so the Greek, it's written in Greek. He also said it will be built in three days. Now we take that, and, and we haven't dug really deep into that. You know, we did a little bit in Matthew, and we did a little bit in Mark. You know, at some point we need to look at Luke and John. But if you dig into it, we need to see what kind of euphemisms, what kind of, you know, verbiage is used, right? But the big deal should be to us that in 70 AD, guess what happened? The temple was destroyed. Every, and by the way, Jesus said... Every block will yeah. be. No, one stone. One stone, one stone. Yeah, and they finally found one stone, right? They've got a couple of stones in the Wailing Wall, and they found one. It's like, okay. Well, that's pretty interesting. Beyond that, guess what happened when the, when the Romans. And I want to talk about Romans a little bit. Okay. The Romans were really a regulatory, um, law based group. So. We are jaundiced. I mean, I, I, I've been forced to watch John Wick, okay? It's not something I really like to watch, all right? But all the movies we see today, what happens? Uh, some hero saves the day, and, and it, you can pretty much predict that that's going to happen at the end, and there's a bunch of action, uh, action and violence usually, and stuff like that. Well, yeah, the, the biggest characteristic to me is, Here's a guy running around and people are firing automatic weapons at him. And every time he fires a shot, somebody is dying and you don't care about him. But they're dying in their own blood and, you know, not even making a sound. And the hero is never even hit. Yeah. If he's hit, he's hit on his leg or his shoulder. And he's yeah. still walking around. Like, if I shot you in the shoulder with an AK-47, I guarantee you, you aren't getting back up. You're going to bleed to death right there and probably be screaming. But we don't depict real violence. In the ancient world, the way you kill people was face to face, right? And the Romans did not like to use slings. They did have slingers. They did not like to use slings and bows because they didn't think they were effective. Now, they did use javelins. But the big deal was when you killed a person in combat, it was face to face. We know the Roman legions. Now, sometimes they said, you know, in warfare, warfare is warfare. And if you read my book, you'll see I try to depict that ancient warfare as it is. But one thing I didn't do that I should probably have put even more emphasis on, but I did kind of try to get that in there, 
is if you are a, it ain't the John Wick world, okay? You're not roaming around with nine millimeters just shooting every person that you see. Why? If, 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 you, if I attack you, even if you don't have a sword, and you scratch me or gouge me or poke me, what could happen to me? Die of an infection. Yeah, the biggest thing that people died of in those days was infections. Now, they would treat you. Remember, they wouldn't treat people with illness, but they would treat people that were injured from warfare, right? David, do you have a, a point or question? Well, I was just going to ask if you've ever read uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman's the book on killing. Mm -mm. Okay, interesting book. He, he maintains that people have this, a natural... Uh, inclination to not kill their fellow human being, and it, it requires a good amount of work in order to kill somebody. Quite a bit of training. Yeah. yeah well, I think I think that's absolutely true. <clears throat> that is, we find that in modern in the modern world, we're desensitizing children and people by showing them John Wick and other things, which you know that's why you get all these crazy stabbings and crazy shootings and stuff because people have been desensitized. So I think it's a really bad thing. But I'm just telling you. When the Romans, it, if the Romans even told them to go into Jerusalem, right, and destroy the temple, what are the Romans going to do? What are the people going to do? If the Romans come in and they say, we've been ordered to destroy the temple, they're going to destroy the temple. Are, if, if a person is running, do you think they're going to kill him or harm him or, harm him or do anything to him? No, but if they stood up to them, right, like if, if the temple guard pulls their weapons and says, not by my shinny shin shin, then what's going to happen? Yeah. It, Over my dead body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying is there, there was, there, it's not like it's depicted. You know, the Romans did not want to kill people. What happens if you kill people? The Roman pilot was a really smart guy. If you kill people, what happens? They can't, can't pay taxes. They can't pay taxes. They can't do work. They can't build your stuff, right? And and admittedly, you know, uh, it wasn't Pilate doing this, but, you know, Pilate had already taken a lot of the money from the thing to build the aqueduct, which is really cool. He took the money from the temple um, treasury because he thought it was a better thing than for the priest to hoard it. So the priests weren't very happy, but what's the big deal about the priests here? They didn't get killed. They didn't stand up. I don't. I mean, they, it says that a bunch of them left, converted. Yeah. Oh, boy. Team Hodos. And you know, we know that from Acts. And and the question is, when was Luke? When did Luke write? I think Luke wrote before 70 A.D. I think he was writing to the. You know, remember he's writing to Theophilus, a Theophilus, who is we think one of the high priests that was set by the Romans. So what you got is, you got, what happened when all of a sudden the temple is destroyed? What did all those priests, which are, by the way, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what happened to the Sadducees? They went to Alexandria. Well, they weren't croaked, yeah. but they go, the Jesus guy, okay, Jesus guy, the most important event in their history, Right? That's only, you know, what, 40, 37. 37 years, right? Almost 40 years, that's it, right? A lot of those people were alive. And then all of a sudden, the destruction of Jerusalem. What do you think Tina Otis has been telling them? This is going to happen. Jesus said this was going to happen. Yeah, Jesus said this is going to happen. What do they go? Ah, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. And we know that from Acts and from Luke, that lots of the Sadducees, which are the priests, were converted to Teen Hodos. Then all of a sudden, when it's the temple's destroyed, number one, they're out of jobs, but number two, what do you think they said? Jesus was right. <laughs> yeah. You know, now the, the Pharisees had a different thing going on, right? Because the Pharisees were part of the already a part of the diaspora. But guess what? Where are you going to find Sadducees? There's only a couple of places. Exactly. So you're going to see Sadducees, but the Sadducees with the in the Essene community in the Essene temple were Essenes. 
right? And the Sadducees, the only other place you're going to find lots of Sadducees is in Alexandria. Except you got a problem, right? The historical problem. It's not Jerusalem. It's not Jerusalem. And so the Pharisees or the Sadducees that are the priestly class in Jerusalem, when they go to Alexandria, they go, What should I do? Exactly! This isn't right! And guess what? Do you think that the, the Sadducees in Alexandria are welcoming to the Sadducees from Jerusalem? <laughs> exactly. You got less food and less money and less good stuff. Plus, remember the big deal is we have we have three school we have four schools, right? We have the school of the Galileo, we have the Jerusalem school, we have the Babylonian school, and we have the Alexandrian school. Are they philosophically and theologically aligned? No. Not at all. The Jerusalem school and the Babylonian school were really closely aligned. The Jerusalem school and the, and the Galil were widely apart. Remember, you know, is it okay to is it okay to sat, uh, to uh, divorce your wife for any reason? Is it okay to uh, do something on a Sabbath? All these things. These questions were questions that the Jerusalem school agreed with, but the school of the Galil did not agree with. The Jerusalem school was a more liberal, libertine school to a degree. The Alexandrian school is a different school. We don't know much about the Alexandrian school. Do you know why? Well, it wasn't documented well. Why? Well, when a huge library, it may have had 20 works. <laughs> That's but also, right. But when did the library get burned down? I can't remember. It was late. It's like, I think, 200 or oh. uh, something like that. I, I'd have to look back. But the, and they blamed it on Christians so that they could do a, 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 you know, a thing against the Christians right at the time. But one of the biggest deals is that the reason the Alexandrian school wasn't written down very much is because of Hebrews. And that's just something I want to get into a little bit if we have time. 90 AD. What happened in 90 AD? Uh, we think about 100 AD, but I didn't include that. I put this in because this is when we think Revelation was probably written around 90 AD. Some people think that John may have been written in this period too. But Revelation marking the last book in the New Testament is a late date book and a late book. This is one of the reasons that Martin Luther and a lot of other Christians didn't like it. Um, it is also a very simple Greek and not very good Greek. But anyway, Revelation kind of marks the end of the period. What I thought was very important for us to note, and this is, this is ammunition, right? If Revelation is the last and the first is Thessalonians, you know, that we have good, ac good accurate data on, uh, this is not that long of a period. This is less than 40 years, right? 38 years. I mean, this is nothing. And so when people, you know, I hear it all the time. I read Brown and the New Testament was written in, you know, 300 AD. It's like, right, okay, right, yeah. You know, I got way too much data, and any historian that doesn't agree with this is a wackadoodle, right? It's, it's, it's just way outside. Did you find out when it was? Well, this one site I'm looking at, first of all, it says as many as 700,000 scrolls may have been in the library. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. But anyway, it said there's three theories, but the earliest one is um, in 48 BC that the library was accidentally destroyed by Julius Caesar. But the next theory is Christian. Ha, yeah. Yeah. So they, I don't think they really know exactly when it burned down. Let's see, I'll keep looking. Which is okay. Which tells you what? It wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal. Okay, like I told you, in a in a library in the ancient world, if you got seven works, you got a complete library, right? And we're I'm talking about up until Gutenberg. If you have seven works, you have a huge library. Up to, it's not like what was that book called? It was a really cool book. Um, they made a movie out of it about the library thing and the library burning down. And they had thousands of words and thousands. Floor upon floor. Yeah, the roads. The name of the roads. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Name of the Rose. Yeah. That is so yeah. false. Yeah. That is, right. Right. you know, right. Mar the fact that Martin Luther, it took Martin Luther until he was, what, 50 years old to find a Bible in a library that was chained to the wall. Does it, doesn't that say something? I mean, our movies, you know, Martin Luther walks into a room and there's books on every corner, right? Filling everything. That, you didn't have that until after the end of the Enlightenment, for goodness sakes, right? As a matter of fact, I had a question by, I was talking to somebody last night about, you know, they said, well, well what about, you know, all these uh, scrolls and codexes and stuff? And I said, they laid fallow in nobilities, libraries, for hundreds and sometimes thousands of years because they collected them, right, and put them in their library and nobody either cataloged or looked at the library and then one day they find, well, huh, I've, got, I've got a copy of Cassius right here or I've got a copy of Hebrews, you know, and the Greek. You know what I'm saying? There are treasures out there that they found and finally, you know, a lot of these moldy old libraries, which by the way, the the king took over because of the uh, one of the ways they destroyed the nobility and destroyed the wealthy in Britain is they taxed the wealth tax, death tax, they debt taxed them to the point where they couldn't afford to keep their stuff. And so That's what? Still going on. And it's still going <laughs> it's on. It's like when uh, you know dukes or whatever they may die. Like these treasures, they have tiaras and all this stuff. Like the government takes it because they're not able to pay the taxes. So all these things are just coming into the hands of the government. Yeah, and it's kind of like that, that picture at the end of the Lost Ark, right, where they have that big thing full of stuff. It's like, yeah, it's like the British government, like, well, you know, we don't know what's in this library, but we're going to pack it up and put it in boxes. And they're sitting there rotten. Oh, now, who the knows? Now, other site said estimates range from 40,000 to 400,000 scrolls, but it said the library quickly acquired many papyrus scrolls due largely to the Ptolemaic king's aggressive and well-funded policies for procuring text. So, I don't know. Another site that I looked at also said the different theories were Julius Caesar and the Christians because part of the library's holdings were in a temple, I guess, the Temple of Serapis or something, and the Christians turned it into a church or something. Oh, no! So oh, well. They said, like, uh, you know, that all you know, pagan scrolls were destroyed or very interesting, but you know, I really would like to know, let's send somebody back in time, but since we haven't found it, we don't know where it is, and we don't have very good accurate data, which should tell you something, right? What do you know about every library in the world, ever? They document the books they have, and if you don't have a list of books, don't, don't you think there was a list of books going around? that maybe we'll find it, right? But there's got to be a list of the, of the works of the books, you know, the scrolls, for example, in the Great Library. Well, where is it? I'm just saying. Anyway, um, let's go look at the chapters really quickly. So the very first chapter, and like I said, I look back all this. Number one, Christ is a God. That's what our Hebrews writer starts with. Christ is a God, and then it has all that stuff about the angels, but I, I took all that. The, the messengers are also ministry. The messengers are ministry. The message beginning in Hebrews is about this, the messengers coming into the, the messengers coming to the Hebrews and ministering with the Hebrews, okay? Um, in chapter 2, this is so obvious. Christ is the Amar. He is the Logos. Remember, it talks about John, but I, I've talked about this before. And I, don't, I don't necessarily think I have to go into huge detail. But remember, Genesis 1, in the beginning, gods, plural. And in the Septuagint, it says, in the beginning, God, Theos. And the, it was a null and void, right? And the Ruach of God, the Hagios Pneuma, the, the Pneuma of God rested on the waters. And then God amarred. And John says, and the Septuagint says, and God logos, which is what John says. The beginning was God, the Word, and the Word was with God, etc. What this is, is first it starts, chapter 1, Christ is God. And the second one is Christ is the Amar. Christ is a power word 
the, the argument that created the cosmos, period, dot. That's what he says. And in chapter 2, it says that Christ annulled death through reason and provided for miss the mark. And the miss the mark is a huge issue. What I did is I put, uh, I, I put it in parentheses for you. Miss the mark, I, I think this is a good word for it, sin and lost opportunities. To the Hebrews, this idea of sin is a big deal. And you notice in our society, what is the big deal in our society? Not sin, but lost opportunities. Lost opportunities. Millions and millions of people, you see it in every movie and everything, right? People lost opportunities. I, when I talk to people, I wanted to do this, but I didn't do it. You know, I wanted to do this, I didn't do it. Tammy works with a lot of people that, you know, have short circuited their lives through drugs or alcohol or through, you know, whatever. You know, things that have destroyed their lives. Lost opportunities. To the Hebrews approaching the Gentiles, the word they used was harmantia, missed the mark. And I think, I'm going to just throw this out, Theolo theological tool. <coughs> The way to approach people today is not about sin, but rather about harmantia, miss the mark, lost opportunities. And Christ is the answer for lost opportunities. That's the message of Hebrews. That's one of the logos to tell us, unstated to tell us. Chapter 3, Christ himself is the logos. Okay, it says that Christ is, is the amar. He's the word spoken by God. But he goes on to say, Christ himself is the argument. What argument? The gospel argument. The argument that, that, that provides for sin and lost opportunity. It, it also has an introduction in this chapter to the concept of God's rest. Kataposis. Those who are not convinced, and this is a big deal. Those who are not convinced, Hebrews, did not enter God's kataposis, his rest. Huge idea, and it equates it with the abode. And also, if we look at Alexandria, what happened? The people were chased out of their place in Jerusalem, and they're looking for some place. They're looking for rest. The answer that Hebrews gives them is, you find rest by being convinced, and Christ is the argument. Four, Israel heard the Logos, but were not convinced of the Logos. Israel was told by God, but they were not convinced. And the, the second part of this, we who are convinced enter into God's rest, just as he said. We must speak the message about Christ and God's rest. That's the Hebrew message. We are the messengers. We are speaking about God's rest, about the argument of Christ. We call it the gospel, but the argument of Christ and about God's rest. And by the way, it's a now. To them, it's a now. It's not, it's not, you're going to enter the rest when you die. It's not you're going home when you die. It's you are in God's rest right now. God provides for your lost opportunity and for your abode. And that's, if we look at people being chased out of Jerusalem because of the destruction of the temple, what are they looking for? A place to stay. They're looking for rest. Um, I think this is really interesting. The second part of five is the rations of God and the sacrifice of Christ. And this is a Truma reference. It uses the words rations, military rations. But this is a, this is a, you know how I've told you before, you see these logos to tell us, they go like this. You know, here's, here's a logos to tell us, and it starts another one, and another one, and then maybe this one continues on, right? And then, right? You see this all the time in these documents. This is the beginning of the Truma argument that we talked about at the end. You know, what is the sacrifice for Christ? Uh, chapter 6, Logos of Christ is the foundation of repentance. So the argument about Christ, the gospel, literally is the foundation for repentance. And the sacrifice of Christ is the anchor of repentance. This was written both to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Chapter 7, the purpose of Melchizedek, the Gentile priest who redeemed Abraham. Christ is equated as a Gentile and the Jewish high priest, the permanent priest for all of them, all of them. Uh, eight, 
Christ is the priest and the offering. The secondary part of this is the new covenant of Christ is the offering and the priest. Um, in other words, uh, Judy asked me a question today, and I thought it was a really good question. We'll talk about it in the in the Torah class about you know what was, were the Gentiles uh, told to do and what were the Messianic Jews or the um, uh, um, Mosaic Covenant Jews, which we're talking about, right? What were they told to do? What you uh, what is Gentiles are you supposed to do? When we talk about the Noahic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant, we'll get more into detail about that. The New Covenant is not... The New Covenant doesn't mean that the Old Covenant of the laws of Mosaic and Noetic and um, Abrahamic and Adamic, those covenants are not destroyed. They're not ended. It means that Christ is, is, Christ is the offering and the priest. In the Mosaic Covenant, who's the priest? From Aaron, yeah, the lineage of Aaron, right? The priestly, the Sadducees, right? Period, dot. What's the offering? What's the offering for sin? For intentional sin? There is none. There is none. But there is an offering for sin, right? Christ in the new covenant, it's, the covenant did not, the, the old covenant didn't change. Christ became the offering and the priest which makes it a perfect offering. This is why that Hebrews says it works. So chapter 9, the actions in the holy place of the new priest. So the actions in the holy place. In other words, explaining how Christ in the covenant, the new covenant, is the offering of the priest. It talks about the problem of sin and lost opportunity, and the answer is the blood of the high priest offered once for all creation. This is exactly, I pulled this right out of what we translated. Chapter 10, the law and the sacrifices were not sufficient or desired, but to persevere in Christ as the solution of sin and lost opportunity. To shrink back is to be destroyed. That's what it says, specifically. Chapter 11, the convinced, the pistis chapter. All these were convinced, and that led to their salvation against sin, but also against lost opportunity. That was the point of that piece, just the convinced chapter. They were convinced, therefore they did something about it, right? There, there were people that were convinced and never did nothing, right? You know that. Back in the Old Testament, there were people convinced, but what did they do? Oh, they picked their nose. I don't know, they didn't do nothing. But the ones we know about are the ones that did something. That's the point. And then Joel. We who are also convinced must train to pass the message. And those who are convinced will not participate in the wrong actions. That goes back, and you know, I didn't repeat the Truma message, but the Truma message is, is we've talked about it over and over again, right? The Truma, what do you do about the Thanksgiving sacrifice? That was a big question for them. And Hebrews answered that question through, um, argument, you know, through the arguments it gives. Thirteen is be hospitable and trained messengers. So work together to convince the leaders and the people. Now, like I said, if you take this, you're going to find that this is not the conventional outline of Hebrews. This is the outline we, you and I, discovered by translating the words culturally. So if this is different, that's good. Because what we did, right, is we boiled down the pieces of the culture and we put a historical point on it and cultural point on it. Does this look logical to you? Yes. It looks really logical to me, but, you know, you're going to have to be the judge of it. I think this is really reasonable and logical. It goes from the point of proving Christ is God to the point of showing what your work, what our, what Teen Hodos work is, what, whether you, that, that's theological, if I call you Teen Hodos, that's a theological concept, but we're Teen Hodos, right? So what are you supposed to do? I think this is a beautiful argument. Next week, what we'll do is I'll go into about translations and about study tools. So thank you, Father, for your word. I pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, my